Jesus' name. You all can be seated. You know, I was uh, I was reading this article the other day, and it just really it just blew my mind. There was this young man, Brett was his name, and he's interested in not one but two beautiful ladies. One was a redhead named Roxy, and the other was a brunette named Michelle. So this guy, Brett, he sits down with Michelle. He says, you know, Michelle, I'm really, I'm very interested in a future with you, but I'm also interested in this other lady. And I'm torn between both of you, and, and I want to I wanna see you, but I want to see her too. And then Brett sat down with Michelle told her the same thing. I'm really interested in you. I want to, I think I want to have a life with you, but I'm not sure. I'm torn between you and this other girl, Roxy. And both of these young ladies agreed to this. And for the next nine months, Brett would take Roxy out one weekend, and Michelle the next. He'd take them out to dinner and a movie or walks in a park you know, hold their hand, tell them how much he cared for them. Eventually grew into day trips, going up to Lancaster for shopping or going to the beach for the day. Eventually grew into extended weekends and more intimate relations. And Brett did that one week with Roxy, one week with Michelle. Brett had been doing that for over a year at the time of this article. And I was like, really? How many women here would agree to that? Sister Kayla, if a guy came up to you and said that, hey, I'm really interested in you, but I'm interested in this other girl, and I want to develop an intimate relation with you and her, would you, would you go for that? No way. Taylor? Taylor, would you go for that? No. I mean, reverse it. I mean, is there a guy here that would put up with that? Right? If some woman said, I'm torn between you and another guy, and I'm going to go... Get intimate with him one week and intimate with you the next. Is there anybody here that's going to agree to that? I think we can all pretty much agree. We all be like, ain't no way. I don't care how much therapy you need. You're still not going to agree to do that. But I want to point out to you that's exactly what most of us do with the Lord Jesus Christ. We come here on Sunday. We get all intimate with God. We move with him, we weep, we feel his presence, we embrace him, we get all intimate with him, and then we go home. And come Monday morning, we're about our own stuff. And Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, we're about our stuff, and then maybe Thursday, we go, we go to community group and we get with him again, just a little bit. Come Friday, we're back to doing our own thing. Saturday, our own thing, and then Sunday, we're here having an intimate relationship with Jesus. And then come Monday morning, we're off doing our own thing. Now, granted, some of us are, maybe some of us are more, some of us are faithful for midweek service. Some of us maybe even spend 30 minutes, an hour a day, praying and reading his word. But in, by large, our majority of our time is focused on making a living, going to school, spending time with friends. First of all, let me say, I'm in that boat too. Now, I think I do a pretty decent job at being a Christian. I try to do my best to live according to God's word. I study his word every day. I pray. I sing praises to him. I go to community groups on Thursdays, on Sundays. I participate in a Bible study for church. I'm here on Sundays. But when I step back and I look at my week in total, if I'm truly honest, I can see that I give attention to many priorities that compete with God. I work a job like most people here. I work a hard job. I have a mortgage to pay, bills to pay. I got to save up, you know, if I want to go on vacation or buy a new toy or whatever. At 62 years of age, I worry about when can I retire? How can I, how can I get done? I'm just tired of working. I struggle with health problems. I struggle with trying to stay in shape. Then every Sunday, the Lord's front and center. But then Monday, I'm back to living Sean's life. 
And then maybe Thursday, Lord's number one again, but back to Friday and Saturday, I go and live in my life. And when I compare how I live to how the people in the Bible lived, especially the book of Acts, I feel like a part-time Christian. I mean, we're an apostolic church. By definition, that means we are supposed to be like the church in the book of Acts. But when I compare myself to them, I'm not cutting it. And when I put myself in God's boots, and yes, in, in my vision, God has boots because I don't believe in open toe shoes for guys. So I'm just saying, in, in my vision, if I put myself in God's boots, I vision him saying, Sean, am I really your God? I feel like your mistress, Sean. You come spend some time with me on Sunday, get a little intimate with me on Sunday. You know, on a Monday, you got your little routine where you get intimate with me, and into, but then you go off doing all your other stuff. Am I really your God? I feel like your mistress, Sean. You know, twice a week, you're spending time with me, but the other five, you're off doing your other stuff all the time. I had to ask myself, am I really living Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God? Or am I seeking him hard on Sunday and Thursdays and maybe an hour or two during the week each day? And then I go off chasing everything else the world has to offer to me. And maybe this message is just for me. Maybe the rest of you all got this living for Christ down perfectly. Maybe you guys, you got your, your life looks like the book of Acts. Maybe every day you're going from house to house teaching. Maybe you're talking about God over the, over the meals and all. You're praying with your children you know, and you're at work and you're just talking about God, maybe this is just for me. But I don't think so. But I do know there comes a time in everybody's life when you have to pick which God or God, small g, you're going to choose. What God are you going to chase? And please understand that making no choice is actually a choice in itself. There's no way out of this. And I have found personally that I've had to make this decision on multiple levels over my life. In fact, the more that God has blessed me, the more distracted I can become. It was easy when I first got saved. I didn't have much. I was at the end of my rope. My life was, my life was horrible. I was ready to blow my brains out. So I had no trouble giving God everything every day. But he starts blessing me at work and giving me houses and cars and money to go on vacation and all these other things. And it's like, oh, I start becoming busy and I get so wound up in all the things he's given me. And like I said, I found that this has been more than just a one-time decision for me. Now, I'll never hold myself up as the model Christian. I'm flawed. I get that. But thank goodness the Lord's still working on me. So I have a question for you, which is the title of our message today. Has he become your God? Has he become your God? I mean, truly, has he become your God? Not just on Sundays and Thursdays or someday during the week, but every day. Is he front and center on your mind when you wake up in the morning? Is he the last thing you think about when you go to bed at night? Are you seeking after his kingdom throughout the day? Are you, are you spending your day talking with God or talking about God? Or are you talking about the Oriole baseball game? Is he your God 24 by 7 by 365? So let's pray. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray that your hand and your anointing would be upon me. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would speak through your servant. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would just... Break down every wall, Lord, every partition of the minds and hearts here today, Lord, and that you would reach out and touch each person, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, if you study the Bible, you're going to see this is not a new struggle. One of the greatest examples in the Bible of this struggle is in the life of the patriarch Jacob, later renamed Israel, by God himself. Now, you would think a man who spent so much time scheming to steal his brother's birthright and blessings in God that Jacob would not have had this struggle. After all, Jacob made no bones about wanting the promises that God had made to his grandfather and his, his grandfather Abraham and his father Isaac. Not only did Jacob want them, he was willing to do anything to get them. 
But the God of Abraham and Isaac did not become Jacob's God for a long time. The first instance we see of this is when Jacob disguised himself as Esau. His father now is old, he's, he's half blind, he's, he's, on his, you know, he's thinking he's going to die and he's going to give out his, his blessing. So him and his mom come up with a scheme. They're going to they're gonna steal the blessing from his brother Esau because he's the eldest, so they make Jacob look like him. Right? He told him to go get some venison, and, and his mother says, hey, I'll, I'll, take, up, I'll take one of the, the lambs and I'll make it taste like Esau's venison. And they, they put fur on his hands and his neck so he is hairy like his brother. They put on his brother's clothes, and, and, and he goes in and he serves his father, right? And, and he's fooling his father that he's Esau. But look, look at in Genesis 27, 20. His, bro, his father's a little uh, suspicious here. Bring up 27, 20. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have found it, talking about the venison, so quickly, my son? And he said, because the Lord, your God, brought it to me. Your God did it, Pop. Not my God, but your God. And you think, okay, well, maybe this is a one-time thing. Nope. In the very next chapter, Jacob is headed to his uncle Laban's house to escape the wrath of his brother under the guise of finding a wife. And Jacob lays his head on a rock to go to sleep, and he gets this dream from the Lord. Bring up Genesis 28, starting at verse 12. Then he dreamed a dream, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven, and there were angels of God ascending and descending on it. Behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord your God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Wow, what a dream. But note, even God referred to him. I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac. God knew that Jacob had not made him his God yet. But you would think if you had a dream like this, this would seal the deal. I mean, you're seeing angels ascending into seven, heaven coming up and down. God shows up and gives you all these promises. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you all this land. I'm going to give you all these descendants, right? You'd think at this point, Jacob would be like, oh, you're my God, right? Nope. Look at Jacob's response in 28, starting in verse 20. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if, if God will be with me and keep me in this way and I am, that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house, then the Lord shall be my God. God had just promised Jacob land, descendants, untold blessings, and Jacob's response is, if you do this, then you will be my God. Now, I've learned from personal experience and in observing the lives of other people, God can bless you mightily. God can bless me mightily. God can give you dreams and visions, but we still have this, if you do this, then you will become my God. Fast forward in Jacob's life. Now he's fleeing from Laban, right? He spent 20 years there. He's running back with his wives and all of his livestock, all of his possessions. His father-in-law Laban catches up to him, and he's not happy now. He, he's coming to actually take back everything. And, and he's ready to go do all this stuff, and he gets a dream from, from God. But I want to draw your attention to Laban's words when he catches up with Joseph in Genesis 31, 29. It is in my power to do your harm, but the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, be careful that you speak to Jacob neither good nor bad. We don't have a lot of the details of Jacob's life for 20 years, but he lived 20 years with Laban, 20 years. And yet Laban's still referring to as the God of your father, not Jacob's God. He's being blessed, untold measure. And he's living his life, but it's obvious to Laban that Jacob hasn't made the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, his God. Jacob was still living in that if phase. And this is further in his response to, 
look at his response back to Laban in verse 42. Unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely now you have sent me away empty-handed. God has seen my affliction and labor of my hands and rebuked me. Jacob's still saying, the God of my father, the God of my grandfather. Then in the next chapter, Abraham, Jacob gets a visit from another angelic visit from God. Calls the place Manaheim. Now Jacob learns his brothers heard about his coming. He's got 400 men coming with him, Esau does. Right? Esau still remember all the things that Jacob said. He wasn't bringing 400 people to throw him a party. Jacob knows he's a dead man, and look how he prays in chapter 32, verse 9. Then Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac. Two recorded visits by angels. God's hand's been on him over 20 years, but Jacob is still saying the God of my father Abraham, the God of my father Isaac. Just how many angelic visits is it going to take him? How many more years does God need to protect and bless Jacob before he becomes Jacob's God? Now, come on, don't tune you out. Some of you are just like Jacob. God has spoken to you on multiple occasions. God has kept you. You didn't die in a car wreck. You didn't die of the drug overdose. You didn't die in that abusive relationship, that abusive home. You grew up poor without nothing. God has blessed you, but you still haven't made him your God yet. You're still waiting. You're still waffling between the things of God and the things of the world. Oh, you're giving time on Sunday and maybe an hour or two during the day. Show up for Thursday group stuff. But when is he going to become your God? So let me talk about my struggle to get spotlight off you. I know because you're all sitting there like, can't look one way or the other. I don't want to know if he was talking about me. Look, I started drinking in fifth grade. Started doing drugs after my senior year in high school. Started bartending illegally at 16. I wrecked my GTO twice during my college years, all messed up. By age 27, I'm a full-blown drug addict and alcoholic. I'm suicidal. I'm homicidal. My life is a wreck. I'm married to a woman that I eloped with that I knew for six weekends. I'm standing in my kitchen on New Year's Eve. I'd opened the strip joints, and I closed the strip, strip joints that day. I'm doing bong hits through a bong, hash bong hits through a bong filled with Jim Beam, not water. And I start talking to God. I said, God, I, I think I have a drug problem. Please help me. Now realize, I'm not going to church I'm not reading a Bible. I have nothing to do with God at this point. But God hears my prayers and he answers me and I never drink or use drugs again from that point on. Never. But three months in, I'm going crazy. I'm, in, I'm going to like nine NA meetings a week. I'm like, I'm struggling and I'm talking to God again. Now realize he's delivered me from all that stuff. One night, no, no rehab, nothing. Just quit. And I'm talking to him. And I said, Lord, if my life doesn't get better in one year, then I'm going back. If, if God, he's done all these things for me, but I'm still like, if God, you don't do more, then I'm going back. Can you believe that? That's my version of Jacob's if story. Over the next several years, I had many encounters with the Lord. Some of them were absolutely mind-blowing. I'll talk about those another day. I start reading an NIV Life Application Bible. I was attending a non-denominational Christian church. But looking back, it's very clear that I had not made Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. I spent time with him. I was searching for him. I was leaning. I was looking for him. Fast forward nine years, I'm clean and sober. God has really blessed me, right? I've got an individual house in Smyrna. That might not mean a lot to you guys, but I grew up in a row home. I never had a house where I couldn't hear my neighbors, right? So this is a big deal to me. I have a five-liter red Mustang. I've got a couple of girlfriends. I'm going to England for work. I spend my weekends in Paris or in London. 
By the world standards, I had made it. I'm miserable. I'm suicidal. I walk in the streets, off the streets, into an apostolic church. Nobody knows me. I now wasn't invited, didn't know anybody, didn't know anything about Pentecostals, except I thought y'all were crazy. And once again, the Lord pulls me out of this mental pit I was living in, and life starts to get better. And I'm born again, but I still have this, well, Lord, I'm going to try this for a year. And if this being born again and a new creature isn't any better in a year, I'm going back. I was 28 years ago. I start teaching Bible studies with a wonderful woman who became my wife. I start teaching at midweek service and preaching. I went on to get all my different licenses, local, general, ordained in July 24, 2008. Now, you would think that I clearly made God my God. I mean, I love Jesus. Been baptized in his name, been filled with his spirit as evidenced by speaking in an unknown tongue. I'm doing a ton of work for Jesus. Right, I'm no longer living like Jacob, but I discovered you can be doing a ton of stuff for Jesus without really making him your God. You can be very busy for Jesus without him being the Lord of your life. Now listen to me here. These next words are very important. There's some of you people here today that are looking at me, that are hearing my voice, and you're not going to make it to heaven. You're telling yourself that I'm not talking about your life. You're thinking while I'm preaching, oh, I'm faithful to church. You know, oh, I, I do this, I sing, I, I usher, I, I teach Bible studies, I work with children, I, I do all these things. Look at me, I look like a Pentecostal. But I'm telling you, you're headed to hell. Look at Jesus' words in Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. They were doing a bunch of stuff for Jesus. They're doing miracles in his name. They're casting out demons. And Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart. You know why? Because this is about relationship. There is more to being a disciple of Jesus Christ than just being baptized and filled with his spirit. Jesus decides, desires a greater, right? We've been talking about greater here. Jesus has a greater, desires a greater relationship with you. And a lot of you folks can, like, just taking a lot of you folks can be a ton, give me a ton of information about somebody, right? You can tell me your, your favorite, like the, the the men have been talking about basketball all the time. They can quote all these statistics on, you know, they fight between, is it Jordan or is it LeBron James? Who's the great? And they can quote all these statistics and all these things, right? And some of you people can do that for sports. You can do it for celebrities. But, but if any of these guys walked up to LeBron James tomorrow and said, hi, he'd look at him like he had three heads because he doesn't know him. You can know a lot about Jesus. You can know a lot of scriptures, but that doesn't mean that you know him. Right? It's about a relationship. It's not about just memorizing facts and figures. It's not about just doing stuff. To get this greater relationship, there comes a time in everybody's life where you have got to personally say, you have become my God. Let's look at another example, the apostles. Right? The apostles left everything to follow Jesus, right? They lift their nets behind, their boats behind. Matthew leaves being a tax collector, right? They follow after Jesus, leave their loved ones. They give up everything to follow Jesus. They spend all their time with him. And if I was to ask you, do you think the apostles had made Jesus their God? You'd say, well, yeah. Look at all they're doing. But look how Jesus, look, look what Jesus says to them. Matthew 16, 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I am? What's everybody else saying about me? Who do they say that I am? Right? He starts very gentle. Who do they say about that I am? But in the very next verse, in verse 14, here's what they say back to him. So some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But then in the next question, Jesus gets to the heart of the matter. Verse 15, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Wait a minute, 
Gee, we gave everything up for you, Lord. What do you mean? I, I've given everything up for you. I, I've, I've got rid of my fishing business. I've, I've left my family behind. I'm going across the whole countryside with you. I spent all my time with you. Well, isn't it obvious? How can you ask me that question? Isn't it obvious? Haven't we already answered that for you by all we're doing for you? Look at what I do. Look what I don't do. Look at how I dress. Look at how I don't dress, Lord. Is that enough? Nope. Every person, every person comes to a point where they have to make the ultimate decision, has he become your God? It doesn't matter what everybody else says. It doesn't matter what everybody else is saying about Jesus. Has he become your God? It doesn't matter if your parents have been serving him since you came out of the womb. Has he become your God? It doesn't matter if you've been coming to church for years. Has he become your God? It doesn't matter if you gave everything up. Has he become your God? It doesn't matter if you're doing a ton of stuff for him. Has he become your God? There is more to this relationship with Jesus than a Sunday and a midweek service experience. It's about walking and talking with him every day. Being a real Christian is 24 hours a day, by seven days a week, by 365 days a year. It's about rolling out of bed in the morning and say, good morning, Lord, what's on the agenda for today? You heard me, it's about letting Jesus set your agenda. Look, I did a lot of stuff for Jesus for a long time, right? And, and, and I was doing all the things I was supposed to do, and, and I was tithing and all that, but it was still Sean's time, right? I'd rather give money than time, right? It used to drive me crazy. We used to do car washes, right? And we'd be there all day doing a car wash, and we'd make $120. I'm like, well, man, if 10 of us got together and each gave 20 bucks in, we'd be done. In five minutes, we wouldn't have to spend all day here because it was my time. And when he becomes your God, it means giving him everything, not just your money, not just your talents, but your time. Let, is he the Lord of your life, really? If he's the Lord of your life, he's the Lord of your time. When you're finally sitting down to relax in the evening and you get that phone call, and you're thinking, oh, I'm just getting ready to relax. Is he Lord of your time? When somebody needs a ride to church and you got all these plans to do all this other stuff, has he become your God? Is he really the Lord of your time? Whose time is it? It took me quite some time before I told the Lord, all right, I'll give you my time. My time is yours. And then it went on from not only my time, but my future. Whatever you Whatever you want to do with me, do. And I don't, I don't even need to know. Not that he was telling me. I wanted to know. But it's a whole different level when you can give him your life and your time and, and live it day by day and say, okay, what do you want to do today, Lord? My time is yours. And when he interrupts your day with other stuff, my time is yours. Look, I'll just be honest. You know, I'd written this message a month ago. Since then, my, uh, my wife has had surgery on June 11th. She can't put any weight on her leg, none. Can't move her leg to the right at all because it's an external abductor. So I have to help Lisa with everything, going to the, take her to the bathroom, getting in bed. We care for two adults with dementia and Alzheimer's, right? I work a full-time job. So the last... Three weeks. I like, like my day yesterday, I did our laundry. Then I did my mom's laundry, stripped the bed, made it dead. Did my father, father-in-law's laundry, stripped the bed, made it dead. And, and a part of me is wanting to complain. And I, the whole time I feel like God's saying, is it my time? I want you to be a servant. Right? I'm not saying this to build me up because I'm telling you, and there's a part of me that was going, give me a break. And God's like, is it my time? 
I want you to be a servant. I taught about serving others. Why are you complaining these last three weeks? I'm giving you the opportunity to live like I commanded you to live. Has he become your God? And, and I mean, like, like Lisa, like every time in the middle of the night, got to get up. I got to get up with her. And I got to get up for work. Yeah, you know, but I'm, I'm up with my wife two or three times at night. And it's like, you know, taking her in a wheelchair to bed. It's like, whose time is it, Sean? Am I really your God? If I'm really your God, then you are going to let me manage your time. Look, I'm not trying to be hard on you or discredit your walk with God or minimize anything you do for him. But I'm trying to get you to realize that there is a greater relationship that Jesus wants to have with you. I love corporate worship. I love when we feel God moving here. I love it. I love screaming and sweating preachers. I wish God had given me a screaming, sweating message. I love those. I have a blast getting together with people. But there is a greater one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus that is available to everyone. It's available and it's meant for us. And most of us haven't even begun to scratch the surface. And that experience truly begins when we determine he has become our God, the Lord of everything. It's easy to accept him as a savior. It's a whole different thing to accept him as Lord. We want the saving part. But most of us don't want to relinquish the control. And we always just want to stop at the money. But the money is just, that's the easy part. Giving them yourself. I tell him, this body is yours. I know you redeemed me and you bought me. But I'm like, my body's yours, Lord. Whatever you want to do with me. Whatever years I have left here on earth, Lord, they're yours. Period. I had surrendered and given my life to Jesus, but I found that every Monday morning I was taking it back and being successful and doing all the other things I wanted to do with career and all the activities I do for God and all these different ministries. And he's done many miracles in my life. He's healed me of an aborted AFib surgery when they're already in my heart and they're afraid I was going to bleed out, and he saved me from that. He took me through five minor strokes. He gave Lisa and I a daughter when we couldn't have our own children. He's given me wonderful grandchildren. He's blessed us financially and work-wise. He's given me a vibrant ministry. Yet I was still in this vicious cycle of, of Sunday just so involved and then Monday taking everything back. You know, and, and, and I would progress, you know, and I would spend, I spend time every day in reading the word and studying and singing worship, but I still wasn't a 24 by 7 Christian. I had to ask myself if I was truly living according to Jesus' instructions in Matthew, 20, 20, uh, Matthew 6, 25 to 34. Let's read these. Just listen to how he tells us to live. Therefore, I say unto you, do not worry about your life. All right, most of us failed right there. How many of us failed right there? Don't worry about your life. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather in barge, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are ye not much more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to a stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, Will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I was definitely failing at that. Why was I failing? Because I had all these small G's in my life. Work, prestige, reputation, education, degrees, certifications, 
trust in retirement savings, vanity, pride, ego, and the list goes on and on and on. Does anybody know, what was the first commandment that God gave us? You know, because he's a jealous God. The Bible tells us over and over again that he's a jealous God. God does not want to compete for top billing in your life. In fact, the very first command he said was, you shall have no other gods before me. It's the first commandment. No other gods before me. Every day. Not just Sundays. You shall have no other gods before me. And if I was honest, I would say that I was failing on that commandment. And when I finally came to that realization of the words to Jesus and his disciples, I'll be honest, I just felt Jesus saying to me, who do, I, who do, I, who do you say that I am, Sean? Who am I to you? And I had to answer that question honestly by looking at my entire life. It was when I finally was able to answer that question that life took on a new meaning for me. I was not, like I said, I was not only able to give God all the possessions and put everything in his hands, but I was able to put me in his hands and say, here, take me. Here, it's, it's, it's your time. Do with what you want. I can honestly stand here before you today and say he is my God. He is number one in my life. What about you? Has he become your God? You know, my wife, Lisa, Lisa knew that I had selected her to be my girl long before I ever asked her out on a date. She knew it. You know how? So this one Sunday after church, I'm standing, there, standing after church, off the calls over, and I'm talking to these two ladies that have been vying for my attention. You know, I'm thinking I'm cool. I'm sitting here talking to these two ladies. And out of the corner of my eye, I see Lisa going down the side hallways to leave church. I stopped those girls in mid-sentence. Oh, Lisa, Lisa. I went running down the hall after Lisa till she stopped, and I got her attention. She would tell me years later, after we're married, oh, I knew. I knew I had you. I'm like, what do you mean you knew you had me? She said, oh, I saw you, and she named the two girls. I saw you talking with blah, 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 and I was thinking to myself, well, if he wants them, let him have them. She said, but then you came running down the hallway, screaming my name. But guess what? I challenge you today to do the same thing for Jesus. I'm done. Stand up. I'm not going to have a fancy altar call today. But I'm telling you right now, you need to make your way to the altar and say, Jesus, Jesus, I'm through. God is not through. God wants a greater relationship with you. But you got to put everything to the side. You need to make a commitment right now. Don't worry about where you're going to go for dinner. What are you going to do tomorrow? You, you need to make sure that he knows that he is your God. Can you do that? Can you actually just, can you stop everything right now? Can we, can we have an altar call without any music? I mean, do you have a desire enough for God that you're willing to come down here and say, Jesus, Jesus, I need you. Not a fancy altar call, not a fancy preacher, but just come down here and say, God, I need you. God, I want to be with you. God, I want you to be number one in my life. Lord, I want to get rid of all those little G's, Lord. You are my God. Lord, this is what you are to me. And Lord, I give myself to you. Start praying. Father, right now in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, Lord, oh, we felt you early today, God, but Lord, Lord, get us beyond just the goosebumps, Lord, and, the, and the, just the 
happy feelings, oh God. Lord, we want you to be number one in our life, Lord. Lord, Lord, we know that you're asking us, who are we to you, God? Lord, you are our God. You are my God, Lord. I give you everything, God. Lord, I give you my time, my talents, God, my body, Lord, all that I have, Lord. I give to you, oh God. Lord, you are number one in my life, Lord. Lord, take control of my life, oh God. Lord, let there be never doubt, doubts, Lord, in everything I do, Lord, or anything I say. Lord, help me to live every day, Lord, to you, God, and to leave it with you, God, every day. Come on, pray. Come on, you need to talk to him. You don't need to hear me.